The Victory Garden is provided in part by Hillis's, complete floral design, culinary market, and customized full-service catering. Hillis's, located in the historic Haymarket District, Lincoln, Nebraska. Welcome to the Victory Garden. I'm Roger Swain. Today, our West Coast reporter, Bob Smaus, up in Oregon, he's visiting Shriner's Iris Gardens, an old-time, family-owned nursery whose sole business is bearded iris. Down in Georgia, Lucinda Mays is putting the finishing touches on a small water feature. She'll tell you how to enter this year's Victory Garden Contest. Back here, I'll be planting globe artichokes, and Marion welcomes in summer with her recipe for strawberries. That's all just ahead, so please, stay tuned. Funding for the Victory Garden is made possible by viewers like you the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by Stern's miracle Grow products, bringing the joy of gardening to generations of Americans. N.K. Lawn and Garden. Seeds, lawn products, gardening books, and products for the young gardener. Helping families grow for over a century. And Monrovia Nursery Company, producers of container-grown ornamental plants, available at nurseries and garden centers nationwide. This might be a good time for you to have a paper and pencil handy because I'm going to take you down the garden path and show you some notable plants. Let's start with this Amsonia, Amsonia taberni montana, a native of the east coast. A really spectacular plant that's not planted enough in modern gardens. It'll take us two or three years for our woodland to begin to look like much, but now the plants are really coming into their own. Just take a look at this Daphne Burke Woody Eyes. Carol Mackey is a variety of, oh, I wish you could smell the fragrance of these flowers. It's been underplanted with a little pink arabis. Next to it is a rhododendron, Ramapo, a bluish rhododendron. And oh, look how that white is just lighting up that dark corner over here. This is Phlox stolonifera, another Native American. We put only two plants in here three years ago, and look how it spread. It's called stolonifera because it forms these surface stems or stolons, which run out and root. And this clump will just keep moving and moving, getting bigger with each year. Next to it, Lanicera tartarica, the tartarian honeysuckle, is in full bloom. And oh, look how this collection is working out. Isn't this nice? This is Dodecatheon media, one of the shooting stars. And next to it, a yellow-flowered trillium. This has the improbable smell of lemon fresh joy. Well, next to it's a red trillium, and this lovely tiarella, or foam flower, which makes a very fine spreading ground cover. Around behind this maidenhair fern is a very nice clump of primula. This particular primula, primula was, was given to us by Sydney Edison. Uh, she lives down in Connecticut, something of a primula specialist. The other side of the path here is a clump of primulas that we raised from seed ourselves and divided several times. Isn't that nice, that combination of the yellow flowers and the yellow leaf on that hosta? This is the season for rhododendrons. Here's a gorgeous bluish purple. It's called blue ensign. It's probably as close to blue as rhododendrons get. They have a very nice blotch at the base of that petal. Well, next to it is one of the mesit series of rhododendrons. This is rhododendron Olga mesit. It's a little past its prime, but you can see it really put on a, a head of bloom. And oh, look behind it. Fantastic trusses. This is really, this is really grand. Now, what What's the name of this one? This is scintillation, rhododendron 
scintillation. Look at the size of those trusses. Here's a Native American, Father Gilla, a close uh, relative of witch hazel, one of the finest spring flowering native shrubs, particularly for small gardens. From the other side of the continent comes a California native, Eumophila maculata, of the so-called five spots for those five purple blotches at the tips of the petals. And this is a tremendous spreader. It's been reseeding steadily throughout this whole bed. On the other side, anemone sylvatica. This is European and Asian anemone. But gee, it would be hard to find anything that made a finer stand. Well, one last plant. Let me show you this. This is Viburnum plicatum tomentosum, the so-called double file viburnum. And it's called the double file viburnum because the flowers are arranged in two neat ranks like soldiers on parade. And looking down from above there, you can see the sterile outer florets surrounding the fertile ones in the center. A very fine plant. I hope you've enjoyed this little walk. I, I think these are plants that will be worthy of any garden, and I hope you'll give some of them a try. Now, all the plants I've just shown you are perfectly suited to this environment. But here's something that nobody thinks of growing in New England. These are artichokes, not our familiar Jerusalem artichoke, but the true globe artichoke, that tender Mediterranean perennial that they grow in California where the winters are so mild as a perennial. But I'm told that it's possible to grow artichokes as an annual here in New England and get them to flower the first year. Because what you eat, that artichoke, is a bud, a thistle-like flower bud. The secret, I'm told, is twofold. One, chilling the seeds, and two, keeping the seedlings cool. Now, to chill the seeds, put the seeds in unshredded sphagnum moss, damp, in the refrigerator for about four weeks. Then pot the seeds up and keep the seedlings cool. And this is what I've got. The young artichoke plant. Gorgeous leaf, lots of structure, texture, very beautiful plant. And even if it never makes any artichokes, it's going to be an ornamental addition to the garden. Now, I'm told, I've never done this before, but I'm told artichokes love organic matter. So I've sifted my compost pile, and I'm going to dig this into the top foot and a half of the soil. Now I'm going to supplement it with a good slug of slow-acting organic fertilizer, then dig that in. Now it's just a matter of making a hole for the individual plants. These are supposed to be set a couple feet apart. Knock it right out there. The roots are said to be delicate, so I'm going to handle it gently and plant it a little high so that the crown is free draining. And then I'm going to mulch it well with straw to keep its roots cool and try to mimic that coastal California climate watered in well. In five to six months from sowing, I'm supposed to be guaranteed a harvest. Thinking of growing tall bearded iris? Well, that's what the customers are doing here at Shriners in Central Oregon. They're looking at hundreds and hundreds of blooms, hoping to find just that right color. And if they find it, chances are it's growing outside in the display gardens. Boy, what a beautiful day and a gorgeous garden. Now, this is the display garden, and it's meticulously cared for because thousands of people come through here to see what's the latest and the greatest in the iris world, to look at this incredible rainbow of color. Now, here's one of the owners, Dave Schreiner. Hi, David. Hi, Bob. How are you? Fine. To get me started here, tell me a little bit about an iris flower and what makes it special. This is a tall bearded iris. Notice the stem. It's 36 inches high. Uh -huh. the, it's called a bearded iris because of these protrusions right here on the petal, yeah. the fuzzy beard. 
We have three pedals that go down. They're called the falls. Uh -huh. Three that stand up are called the standards. Very logical. Iris also have branches and buds. Uh, two buds here, two buds here. Should have six to seven blooming buds to extend the blooming time. Well, what's your favorite color? I like the dark colors, the strong masculine purples like Dusky Challenger here. This is oh, a good, yeah. strong, ruffled iris. And I, what I like about Dusky Challenger is its performance. Look at the way this flower grows. Look at the plant vigor that goes on. Beautiful there. thing. What about your wife? What's her favorite? Oh, my wife <laughs> likes smaller <laughs> things and more delicate. Uh -huh. uh, she likes something like Starcrest. And most of our customers are female, quite frankly. Look at, look at the pastel lavender. With, and here we've taken the tangerine factor and put the orange beard on You can't there. miss the beard on that iris, yeah. can you? Now, sometimes the standards and falls are different colors, right? They certainly are. <laughs> Let me show you Edith Wolford here. Uh -huh. This is something new that came out in the late 80s. Well, that's a different Very color. ruffled lemon standards. Nice, lighter, bluish lavender falls. Hmm, beautiful so thing. Bicolor. So if there's two colors, it's a bicolor? Bicolor or bitone. That's bicolor. This is another... This bi is another bicolor that we specifically call variegata because it's a, a combination of yellow and red. Why? Supreme Sultan. Do you feed this more? Why is the flower so much bigger? Uh, this is in the genetics of, of Supreme Sultan. It's just, just very vigorous. Look at the size of that flower. It's a good mm -hmm. six to seven inches long from here to here. It's just Tandy. beautiful. And, and again, plant vigor. Well, you know, blue is my favorite color, so dazzle me with a blue here. Show oh. me a really spectacular blue. Ooh. Look at rapture in blue here. Oof. Look, at, look at the ruffles on that. Look at the nice blue color. Uh, and the blue is, is a color that a lot of other flowers don't have. I think that's what makes, makes iris special, is we have good blue colors in the irises. Well, here's one that has a different colored center instead of edge. This one's rosette wine. We saw this pattern developing out in our ceiling fields where underneath the beard there was this white pattern. We call that a zonal pattern after the zonal geranium. We actually had to make up a name for that type of pattern in a flower. Very pretty. Now, how about uh, yellow? I know iris are famous for yellow. Oh, we've got all shades of yellow you could ever want. Look at golden ecstasy. We have a golden yellow and golden ecstasy. Good strong yellow. We have a lighter yellow. Rising moon. More in, more in the lemon shade of yellow. Yeah, like Very that. broad flower form. We've read the yellows towards the blended colors and got things that are tan and brown. Look at fancy brass here with, with the shoulder marks. They're going to tan and, and tan standards. Here. Real pretty. Well, this, this gets you into that so-called red. Do you have a lot of trouble with red in iris? <laughs> We've been working on red for 50-some years because the red pigmentation is not natural to iris. Uh -huh. I'll show you a red iris. This is unforgettable fire. We've been breeding reds from the brown side. This is what we call red iris. Yeah, it's kind of bronzy, isn't it? Well, I'll show you another one. We've also been breeding them from the wine side. Yeah, don't adjust your color knobs. <laughs> This is Danger. Joe Gaddy did this out of California. Uh, that's more like red. Huh? Yeah, so that, that's a good good red color. Red, Not a rose red, red but it's uh, red for an iris. Real nice. Well, what's another tough color for you that people want? People have asked for green iris. Oh, yeah. We don't have a green <laughs> iris. We've taken some of the light yellows like Rising Moon, and we've worked them to the lime side. And I'll show you a yeah, green iris that we have. Well, Dave, how many people tour the garden on a sunny weekend like this? Well, you hit it just right. This is the weekend of the Kaiser Iris Festival Parade. Uh, we should have maybe 1,500, 2,000 people out here looking at the iris today. Well, that's a nice crowd. But, you know, as I walk along, I don't see any green iris. Bob, <laughs> open your eyes. Oh, uh -huh. that's green. Well, I should have known. It says Irish tune. <laughs> well... So you can do almost anything with iris, but who's doing all that work for you? Who's your hybridizer here? My cousin Ray is handling the hybridizing in our operation. Now, you know, Ray, to my untrained eye, it looks like we're walking through a field of winners here. Yes, these are winners. This is the y'all we'll be going with next year with the ruffles and lace. The one right over here is Mulberry Punch that we put in our catalog this year. Again, it's a very different color with the flare and the ruffle. But these are the final selections. To get there, you grow what? Thousands of seedlings? We raise about 20,000 seedlings, and from there we maybe introduce 15 or so. Oh, my gosh, that's a lot of work. Now, how do you actually make the cross so that you get seed? What you, you do is you take, a, say, take this blue over here. You'll take the pollen from right here. Oh, that little white thing there? Correct. Uh -huh. And the, take, you take a tweezers and pull it out, 
and it's got its fertile pollen right there. And from there, you will go and put it on. What shall we cross this with? Say maybe this crinkled white over here. And hopefully from this process, you're going to get either a better blue or maybe a blue with crinkled. You put on the stigmatic oh, lip, okay, you can so kind of see invisible, that. It's almost invisible, but I can see the little sticky stuff on it. And rub that powder there, and hopefully after the cross takes, your seed is already down here. And from there, you'll possibly get 100 children from that cross. Oh, and hopefully now, can I, I do this at home? Yes. It's very Will I get a beautiful iris? You may get a better one just with one cross. But I'll probably get a bunch of dogs, right? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Well, Dave was saying that red is one of the colors you're working on. Have you got any great reds to show us? Well, red is a hard color to get in the true fire engine red. We've got what we call, I say, more bronzy red, or we call this color red. Now, to a lot of people, it's maybe bronze, but it's a two-tone, uh -huh. velvety red. I can see some red in there. There's a maroon, which is a very nice, a deeper sheen to it. Yeah, it's But over here, we have a red that we're going with next year. Again, it's a very nice, there's more, this seems to be redder in this light anyway. Two-tone, very nice with the yellow beard, flare. Now, this you haven't even introduced? Have you named this, it yet or anything? No, this is currently a ceiling number, and from, it's one we selected two or three years ago, and after evaluating it the last couple of years, we decided it is a top red and we'll be going with it. So what we're seeing are tomorrow's iris today. Correct. Well, thanks, Ray. I've really appreciated it. If this little scene has encouraged you to grow iris yourself, make sure you mark on your calendar next May when they're all in bloom. Listen, Ray, I wanted to ask you about that white one. Hi, welcome again to Victory Garden South here at Callaway Gardens. Today we have a capital improvement to make, and these ivies are just part of what we'll be using. The rest is over here. You may remember a few years ago, we had this stone planter constructed by a local artisan. We love the planter. It's right out here in front of the porch, but had a terrible time growing plants in it. Everything we tried just cooked because of the heat that is collected and radiated by the stones. So we've been trying to come up with plants that we can grow in here that would be happy. And we thought, why not a water garden and grow water plants? So to do that, we had a liner fabricated to set down inside the planter. Very simple, made of aluminum, fabricated by a local fabrication company and welded together. It's watertight. Now inside and along the edges, I sprayed it with rubberized paint, which is simply the undercoating that they use on automobiles. In fact, I picked the paint up at a local auto parts store. The next step will be to set it down in the planter, and I've got sand in the bottom. Now, the sand is to help with drainage so that when it rains or if it gets overwatered, the water will flow away. It also stabilizes and serves as a base for this planter. Now, the next step will be to provide something for the plants that are going to go along the edge. I need something on the edge because the stone is rough and the edge of the liner is not. So I'm going to put potting soil down in here and then I'm going to plant rooted cuttings of English ivy to cover the uneven edge and to provide a nice soft look to it. Here's my potting soil and I've mixed it with time-release fertilizer so that the ivy roots will have something to feed on while they're down in here. Now this is a messy part of the job, but it'll all wash up later. Now we have the perimeter filled in with potting soil. And next I lay in the rooted cuttings of the ivy. Now you think they'd get hot in here, but the water inside is going to have a cooling effect, so those roots will be just fine. It's a time-consuming process, but think of the effect of the soft ivy foliage next to the water's edge and cascading over the stones. Now the next step is to lay in the sphagnum moss. It's been soaking in this bucket overnight. It's really moist and ready to go. I'll lay it in around the edge here. It will keep the potting soil from floating out when I water and into the water here. And if the sphagnum moss stays moist enough, the ivy will lay down on it and, and send out roots into it. It's a good thing to do. I buy my sphagnum moss by the bale from my local garden center. 
And a little sag moss goes a long, long way. This is one of those tedious, long jobs, but it's really worth it. Okay, now a couple of bricks. And I'll show you what this is about. I have some little tiny water plants that are going down in here. They're called floating hearts. Tiny little heart-shaped leaf and a delicate little white flower. And I'm going to set these small pots on the bricks. Because if I put them in the liner down on the bottom, their foliage would be covered by water and I couldn't see it. So the next step is to put the water in. And I'll fill it with a hose. And add a little vegetable dye. This is a water gardening colorant. Very strong, non-toxic black dye. It makes the water opaque so that you can't see the bricks that are holding up the plants. Now the last thing that remains is to set in the plants on top of these invisible bricks. There we go. Once these get settled in, we're going to have a very nice little addition to Victory Garden South. In fact, I'd like to enter this in this year's Victory Garden contest, which is all about water gardening, but they won't let me. I can't enter my little water garden, but you can. Here's the rules and here's how. Entering the contest is very simple, providing you're an amateur gardener. All you have to do is send us a photograph of your water garden. No slides, please. A diagram and a list of the plants you're growing. Then send it along with your phone number to the Victory Garden Contest 1992, 125 Western Avenue, Boston, Mass, 02134. Eligible entries must be received by Wednesday, July 29, 1992. All entries become the property of the WGBH Educational Foundation, and they are not returnable. Okay, so come on, everybody join the Victory Garden Water Gardening Contest. Let's take a look at this before we get into the vegetable garden. I've got Stelladoro daylilies in the back doing their thing. They've just come into full bloom. The ornamental cabbages, which are color up red, look as good as they can in the spring. They're just wonderful. In front of those, majestic giant red pansies, and then the little alyssum dotted in and out as cheers rose. Really good combination. I'm happy with that one. But over here in the vegetable garden, I have some harvesting. This Sputnik spinach has been producing all spring long. But now that the hot weather has come, it's starting to bolt and put on flower heads. So it's harvest time. I'm going to harvest and pull at the same time. Now that I've got the spinach pulled out, the next step is to add a little of my favorite soil amendment, which is composted poultry manure and peanut hulls which a little lime has been added. And what this does is build up the soil and give a nice, gentle, balanced fertilizer to what I'm going to put in next. I'm going to dig that into the top few inches of the soil. Now, the next crop to go in is some southern peas. Southern peas like it hot, so we waited until the soil is good and warm. And I've soaked these overnight. These are pink-eye purple holes. They're one of the best. I'm going to lay them in pretty thickly because not everything is going to come up. Cover them over. And that's that. Now the next thing I want to plant is some okra. So I'm going to set in a little furrow about an inch or so deep. And last night I started soaking some Clemson spineless okra. It's a good standard variety for down here. It's a little more comfortable to pick than the others because it doesn't have the spines. Now, okra seeds shatter very easily, so that's why I'm laying them in this thick. Some of these seeds are not going to germinate. And if they come in too thickly, I'll just thin them out. That's all there is to that. And now for my favorite scene, and I've been waiting for this all day, they asked me to come out to the field to pick strawberries for Chef Marion. And they didn't have to ask me twice. One for Chef Marion, one for Lucinda. If you have the need for a drop-dead dessert, but don't have enough time to make one, try this, strawberries with store-bought macaroons. I took a quart of strawberries that were, of course, washed and 
cleaned and dried and then removed the cores, just like that. Then the next step is to take half of them and simply slice them into thin slices and set those aside in a bowl. The other half go right into my handy food processor and get pureed. Let's see here. Oh, that looks good. Nice and liquid, but I don't want all the seeds that are in here. So I'm gonna pour this puree into a sieve over a bowl and then press the juice through the sieve. The seeds will stay behind. Okay, that just about does it. Get all the last few juices there. And then all I'm gonna do to this beautiful sauce is add a little bit of flavoring. That's about two teaspoons of lemon juice and a tablespoon of very super fine sugar that will dissolve right in there and a little tiny bit of orange liqueur. That should taste very nice and I'll refrigerate this until I'm ready to assemble my dessert. Okay, here comes the fun part. Here I've got my strawberry sauce, sliced strawberries, I've whipped up a little cream and my store-bought macaroons. The first step in assembly is putting a nice puddle of the strawberry sauce on the plate. And then I'll stick on one macaroon right in the center and maybe a tiny more of a drizzle on top so that'll soak in there. And then a nice helping of sliced straw.